Hello there, Alaskans, wherever you are. Welcome to the Must Read Alaska Show. Coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. This is the place where we talk about, you guessed it, Alaska. Where we keep the mainstream media on their toes and where we are standing up for what's right and a world run by leftists. You can find out more by heading over to mustreadalaska.com and also checking out the Must Read Alaska YouTube channel for some really great content. But first, let's get this party started. Well, welcome everybody to the Must Read Alaska show. I'm your host, John Quick, coming to you live from somewhere in Alaska. We hope everybody had an amazing weekend. And if you did not get a chance to catch Friday's Must Read Alaska episode, you're going to want to go back and check that out. An artist by the name of Derek has a brand new show on the Magnolia Network, which is a network owned by Chip and Melinda Gaines. It's on HBO Max, Discovery Plus, and obviously its own network, Magnolia Network. And um, He's got a brand new show called The Peacemaker, peace meaning puzzle piece. He does folk art all around the U- uh, U.S. and all around the globe, and he turns the folk art into puzzle pieces. If you are into puzzles, this guy is like the puzzle king, and the first episode of the brand new show happens to be in Anchorage. So you're going to want to go check that out. Um, if you have HBO Max, you can check it out there, Discovery Plus, and our uh, interview is obviously free. Uh, on uh, iTunes or Pandora, Spotify, anywhere a podcast can be found. You can check that out. We also want to thank our show sponsor. This month, our show sponsor is the University of Alaska, and which is very exciting. So we want to thank our show sponsor. You can learn more about our show sponsor at empower.alaska.edu. Go check that out. And, uh, you know, we just uh, can't say enough good things about them being able to sponsor the show. That's pretty awesome. And we want to thank them for doing that. We're going to put a link to that also in the description of the podcast for you to go check out. Uh, But without further ado, I want to welcome our our guest today, a gentleman named Paul Rowland, and he wrote, produced, directed a brand new feature film called Exemplum. It's kind of uh, making some good waves across the, the, uh, the film industry in the last couple of weeks. It's been featured uh, several times by Breitbart News, He was on the Babylon Bee podcast, um, and it's won Best Director at the Pasadena Film Festival, and it's a pretty awesome film, but I want to thank and welcome Paul Rowland to the Must Read Alaska show. Welcome to the show, Paul. Hello there. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm excited that you're on. We're going to get into um, your movie, obviously, but but first, just tell us... um, We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, you won some awards and those kinds of things. It's very exciting. But first, talk to us about how you got into film in the first place. I always think it's fascinating for folks to hear, you know, somebody's story about how they got into their trade or their craft. Absolutely. So I uh, got I've been studying filmmaking since uh, high school, actually. Uh, I was very fortunate to um, be in a class. Uh, in my junior year, uh, where I was studying advanced films at age 15, I was watching uh, f- films of Fritz Lang, F.W. Murnau, Ingmar Bergman, uh, just, I mean, you name all the classics, French New Wave. Uh, so that's where I started getting into it, and uh, I've been pursuing it ever since. I studied mostly screenwriting in college, uh, and I fell away from it for a brief period of time, and then I struck back up uh, in 2015, and it's just been going on ever since then. I've written about seven screenplays. Uh, I produced about 10 comedy sketches with my friend Adam Yenser, who uh, was a writer for Ellen DeGeneres. Now he's a writer for the Babylon Bee. Uh, and uh, by the time I came to create this film, it was basically a matter of was I going to make a short film or was I going to make a feature film? And so I basically said to myself, I'm going to make a feature film with the little bit of money that I had. And my budget for this was $9,000. I love uh, it. Yeah. So I had great admiration for the 1990s independent filmmakers, people like Christopher Nolan, Robert Rodriguez, Darren Aronofsky, uh, Kevin Smith. In many ways, Spike Lee was a precursor to this with She's Gotta Have It. So I admired them so much and i thought to myself if i admire them why not just do what they did and so i forged through ahead and exemplum was born that's pretty awesome tell so tell me about what's the creative process for you 
to, you know, it's one thing to direct the movie. It's one thing to write a movie. It's one thing to produce the movie, but you did all three. So what was your creative process for this particular film? Yes. So that's always a very good question. This really comes in to the, when you have so little money that you're working with and so few resources, your entire career, you, you basically, you have no artistic freedom at all. You have to construct your entire story around what you know you can get for free or relatively cheap. So I knew that I could get a Catholic church for free. I knew I could get at least a bar or a restaurant for free and I could shoot guerrilla filmmaking in, in various parts of the city. So I always had in my head this idea about a Catholic priest that records his confessions. I didn't know where that would take me or what, what kind of story that would be, but that was in the back of my head. So when I started writing the script and pairing it with what I knew I could get for free, that's how the story really came about. Uh, I started creating the idea of him recording the confessions, formulating psychological profiles about people. I had come from conservative media and Catholic media, so that's where the idea of his television show, his internet show came about, him getting internet following. I had previously written a script about hacking and surveillance state and the moral dilemmas of that. So that's why I knew I wanted to have it be a film noir blackmail kind of story. Uh, and I think the idea of taking people's sins and recording them and keeping them yourself, I think it was just right for a story about blackmail and the, the, the evil of, of holding people to account uh, uh, for things that you're supposed to be getting rid of. Uh, and that's how Exemplum was born. It's really uh, not really a matter of artistic freedom. It's really just a matter of what I know I can get for free. Now, the good thing uh, <laughs> I think is about, because I've spent a lot of time writing scripts uh, with a mindset of artistic freedom, you know, big budget scripts, it allowed me to, when I came to write this story, this small story, uh, to think big with the emotions. You know, I knew how to create a sense of urgency to the film and get creative with how I utilized the locations and the editing and play up uh, the emotions of the characters and allow that to speak rather than allowing the budget to overtake things. Yeah, some may argue you, re you really had to be more creative because without a budget, you really got to think outside of the box where most people can just, just cut a check for something. You had to think through, how do I do this for free? <laughs> completely, completely, absolutely, absolutely. There are whole story decisions in this film. It's pretty much decided upon by what I can get for free. I mean, I, I want to be clear. I mean, there are locations I didn't even know I was going to get until like two days before. I, I, I would finish up a weekend filming this thing, and I would I had no idea what we were going to be at next week. If we were going to get what we needed, no clue. There were like three places that would fall through, and then something would come through at the last minute. So it's a wild experience. So you got the film was nominated and won for best director at the Pasadena. Film Festival, I believe I'm saying that correctly. Tell me about what that was like for you being nominating and, and winning uh, that award. That's got to feel pretty good. Oh, it was exhilarating. You know, uh, the festival circuit is already difficult as it is. Uh, I mean, film festivals basically are, are, are rigged. I mean, there's no other simple way to put it. Uh, if you want to go to a large scale film festival, like say Sundance, Toronto, any of these, you don't get in un un unless you know the people who, who work there or somebody in your production team knows the people who work there. It's as simple as that. You know, Pasadena, well, I was very fortunate. It was a, it was a very fair festival. Um, they didn't curate and uh, they, they care very much about um, accepting um, the blind submissions there. So, uh, so already getting into a festival is hard enough. Even a low level one, it's hard enough yeah. because there's so many you know, films that are so, so many feature films that are submitting. I mean, at Indie Rights, where I submitted my my film for distribution, they get ten films a week. There, no, 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 sorry, uh, ten films a day there. Oh, I think they, that are submitted, and they only submit fifty something films a year. Yeah, I don't, so I, I, don't, a, I don't think people realize that most of the film festival films are like million dollar budget films or higher, right? Yes, yes. So I mean, getting into a festival is very hard, and then. You know, uh, and then winning an award at that festival uh, 
really difficult because you're always at the whims of whatever the selection committee uh, or the jury uh, are, and you have no idea what criteria they're using to select their films. So uh, to win Best Director was 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 a wonderful uh, experience. Uh, I was up against uh, some films that had uh, well over $100,000 budgets and full working crews. Uh, and I had $9,000 and just four crew members. And the fact that I was able to pull that out. Um, no, that, that was a wonderful night. Uh, you can see my speech that I gave uh, on my Instagram page. Nice. So tell me, why did, what, what's, what about this film is special to you, looking back on all the work that you did to produce and make it, direct it, write it, win it an award? Um, somebody's going to listen to this interview and kind of decide for themselves, should I go watch this film or not? So what makes this film special to you, the guy that made it? That's a wonderful question. It's actually something that nobody's asked me yet. Uh, what's most special to me about this film is that I actually think it encapsulates my vision and my plan as a filmmaker and what kind of works that I want to bring. The name of my production company is Palindrome Pictures, and that's very symbolic to me. Uh, this connection between the past and the future and bridging it all together to create this cultural presence. And I, as a filmmaker, uh, want to be able to take, you know, past traditional values and traditional aesthetics and blend them with our modern age or modern technological age and find that harmony uh, and find whatever truth that can be found in that. And so I think Exemplum actually, I think if, represents that quite well. It takes uh, my, my views as a, as a Catholic uh, and, if, and puts it together with this modern story, uh, this modern crime thriller story and has a moral reflection about the kind of age that we're living in. I do, even though I didn't set out to do this, this was not my intention, I think it just sort of developed as I was writing the story. I do think it is a uh, a moral and theological, philosophical reflection on cancel culture, the idea of taking people's sins and using them for power and gain and using them as weapons against people and nobody's ever really free uh, of any of their past misdeeds. Uh, so I, yeah, the example is very special to me in that regard. <laughs> yeah, internet is forever. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So how hard is it to quote unquote make it in Hollywood? Um, you know, there's going to be folks listening, like maybe they're, you know, first year freshmen at, mm -hmm. at film school and they're like, you know, into their second class and they're thinking to themselves, holy crap, I don't know, how am I going to do this? You know, less than 1% of the people that set out to do this actually make it. How hard is it in this day and age with all the technology and Instagram and Tic Tac and all those things to still make it in Hollywood and be where you're at uh, and be sitting on the other side of the screen having won an award for a film that you made yourself? Well, that really depends. You know, I like to tell people that Hollywood is like the Wild West. Uh, that's both good and bad. It's bad because you get really disgusting, horrible individuals that I think get into power. And people like Harvey Weinstein. Uh, uh, bad in the sense that, you know, prevailing um, trends and attitudes uh, become uh, away from what is you know what should be about the the art and the creative process and delivering audiences something special uh but it's also good in the sense that you know nobody really has control over everything that's kind of an illusion uh, there are things that can come out of nowhere and completely and totally change the game you know what we're doing here at, with example what i think what a lot of other filmmakers are doing you know uh i would tell the film students don't get caught up on that you know, that was one of the worst things that I, the, the worst advice or the worst, you know, messages that I ever got when I was in film school was people telling, it's so hard. It's hard. It's hard. It's very difficult to make. You got to know people, you know, only people who know people, make you, you got to have a dad here. That, and that's, that doesn't help you. It doesn't help you at all. Your only concern as a film student and as a filmmaker and as a writer is to create great work and go through the, the hell and the fire and the flames to do that. Uh, and if you're committed to that, you're committed to uh, reaching inside of yourself to craft that wonderful film, 
that's going to unite people and inspire people. Uh, you're going to beat it. You'll, you'll beat it. You will. I believe that. Uh, and don't uh, don't listen to a single negative voice that tells you otherwise. So you've you've decided to write to have films that have some meaning to them. Obviously, your first film has some uh, a lot of religious connotations and Mm -hmm. um you've gotten the eye of babylon b and bright breitbart um some mm -hmm. of that's from a relationship it sounds like that you had but i think that that's a unique route for a film to get positive attention from two news places that would be kind of right of center our our news channel must read here or right of center is that a unique place where you think films maybe haven't taken an opportunity to um be produced and made for more of a conservative crowd or is that just by happenstance that this is you've gotten some attention from conservative news well i mean uh i yes of course i know the, the writers at the uh, babylon b in fact seth dylan the ceo of the babylon b contributed to this film uh nice. and uh my uh i i actually you know paul roland is my directorial name and i'm going to keep it that my directorial name but actually i am a writer for breitbart news you can see my byline uh oh, paul nice. Wall at breitbart news uh so that explains why they're promoting this so much but but you know i mean they but they're promoting it because they they really like the film i had the uh, our CEO Larry Solov and uh, our editor in chief Alex Marlowe at my premiere uh, last year, and they both uh, were he uh, over the moon for the film, and so was uh, Rebecca Mansour, our managing editor. Uh, so everybody, every so they're giving it press because they really like the film, and not just mm -hmm. because they know me. But uh, you know, I I will I'll take this film wherever you know it goes. I'm trying to make uh, movies that will unite people you know if conservatives uh, if republicans and democrats you can all sit in the same room and watch my movie uh and then talk about it afterwards what they liked and what they don't like and that that that's a good thing i i did something you know that's what culture is supposed to be about culture is supposed to be this unifying language this universal language that we all can discuss and fall back on you know when all the other things you know fall apart uh and that's that's it's unfortunate that it's dying in this uh atomized age of ours you yeah, know but i would say you know take your take your film anywhere take you know, whoever will cover it you know i mean I, I highly doubt a marxist publication would ever you know want to you know cover this right hey now. but if they did yeah more power yeah. to them right yeah exactly exactly <laughs> so what's next for you what's uh um is there are you on the front end of the film festival um tour is it the tail end of it or you got another film in the works what's next for your plate here in the next year or so well we're completely uh, done with the film festival circuit this movie is available for free for public consumption you can watch it on tubi uh if you can uh i would highly recommend watching it on vimeo on demand uh for just a rental price of 199 you'll get a high quality stream and no ad breaks and the movie is meant to be watched contiguously without any breaks so that's where we're at right now with this film uh we're just getting the word out up there about that and uh telling everybody to watch it uh and in the next few months, I'll know where I stand. I think the next best option for me would be to create a uh, probably I've proven myself on the ultra low budget uh, scale. Now I think I think I can probably prove myself on a more I would say a healthy low budget scale. Like I, my next movie was like a hundred thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars, and then after I prove myself with that, and then prove myself with a couple million dollars. Nice. So let's say you had a time machine, you could go back 10 years from now and tell yourself one piece of advice. What would that be? Mm. I would say don't get caught up on who you know, on where you're at. Just be consumed and focused on creating that good work all. But it's tough, you know. Um, I do think that the fact that I was writing all the scripts before I approached Exemplum. I, I could not have written Exemplum 10 years ago. I really don't think I could have uh, back then. I don't think I had the skill sets as a writer yet uh, or the maturity as a storyteller to be able to craft this kind of low budget film. Uh, so, so it's difficult. I would tell myself, you know, write what you can create and really focus on, you know, just creating that. But at the same time, I think because I was, I did write those screenplays before this, I was able to craft, I think, what was a compelling low budget story. 
because I had knowledge of creating a what I would say an emotionally urgent story, you know, on a large scale, I figured out how to create an emotionally urgent story on a smaller scale. So it would see, you know, I think so sometimes they're just our, our paths just go the way they, they do. And I don't know if you can manipulate that. Unless you're back to this year, unless you're Michael J. Fox and they, yeah. so uh, you're sitting on a last question to you is this, you're sitting on the beach, you're 75 years old, you're enjoying a Mai Tai or a pineapple juice. What do you want to, be remembered by as you look back on your career? I want to be remembered by, <sighs> hmm, that's, you know, that's really tough to, to answer. You don't, you know, I would say ultimately I want to be remembered because I, 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 I was, I was good to the people around me. I fostered a good community. I think that's most important to me. Uh, obviously I want to be remembered as a great filmmaker and I certainly do. Uh, but what I'm about is building community and, you know, building relationships between people. Um, if I could be known as a, a man who, who built a, a thriving community in Hollywood of, of Catholics and Christians and conservatives who were making terrific, terrific cutting edge art that really did, um, power the culture to a new and interesting place that nobody expected. I would be, I would love to be remembered as that. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, one more time, tell us where we can find your movie uh, for uh, watching it. I think there's two places we can watch it. So tell us again real quick on what those two places are. And I'll put a link in the description as well. Absolutely. You can watch it on Tubi for free, or you can watch it on Vimeo On Demand for just a rental price of $1.99. And with that, you get a high quality stream and no ad breaks. Nice. Well, for folks that are listening, go to Vimeo On Demand, get that uh, $1.99 movie, go watch it. I want to encourage everybody that listens to this podcast to go spend the two bucks and watch the film and, and uh, support somebody who's trying to make a difference in Hollywood in a different way, forging his own path. So, Paul, we wish you nothing but success here at Muscat, Alaska. Can't wait to see what you produce next. And um and uh, keep us keep us up to date. We'll have you on again sometime. Oh, thank you so much. It was a real pleasure being here. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for listening, tuning in. Until next time, I'm John Quick from somewhere in Alaska.